a holiday weekend perhaps, if you will take the friendship folders located on the inside aisle and sign them with, put your contact information and pass them down the pews at some point during the service, we would greatly appreciate that. I do have a few announcements. Peggy Campbell had back surgery this week at Baptist East and she is home at the moment recovering. So keep Peggy in your prayers and keep the Johnson family in your prayers. Sue Johnson is now under hospice care. Ladies Book Talk will meet this Tuesday, May 31st at 11.30 a.m. in the Barrett Room. And next Sunday, June 5th, begins our summer worship schedule. We will continue with our 8.30 service in the chapel, but we will move this service back to 10 o'clock, one hour. So 8.30 and 10 o'clock begin next Sunday, June 5th. Now, all of you, hopefully, or most of you, received one of these pamphlets, and there's some really cool stuff happening next weekend. Uh, this information is also on the back of your Good News to Go. Um, food Truck Friday, 6 o'clock, Saturday morning, if you haven't done the walk, the historical walk with Maggie yet, uh, that's at 10. And then after that, uh, Abby Witt, who will be going to the Brevard Music Summer Institute, after the walk at 12.30, right here in the sanctuary, Abby will be having a cello concert. So if you want to come back after the walk and listen to Abby, that would be fantastic. Uh, make sure you check that out. I think that is all of our announcements. If there are no more at this time, please stand and greet one another. I also want to let you know we do have a special offering today for World Mission. Karen Morris is here and you will hear from her a little later in our service. Let us pray. Gentle God, we pause now, listening in stillness for an awareness of your presence. Breathing out, letting go of our tiredness, our frustrations, our anxieties. Giving ourselves to you that you may hold us in your peace. God, help us to live fully and openly and hopefully to trust in your limitless mercy and grace. Amen.
Please stand for our call to worship. We come in reverent awe before the Lord our God, for great is the Lord. We come in worship and praise, for the Lord God is worthy of our praise. Let us worship God. sing the goodness of the Lord, and nowhere is that goodness seen more than in God's forgiving mercy. And because we can be confident of God's forgiveness, we can come to confess our sins using the words that are here in the bulletin. Let us pray together. We want you to know, holy God, that we do try between the politicians and the media it is easy to become confused as to how we should live. We spend so much time trying to win the approval of certain people that we forget our call to serve those around us. We are so busy telling others, go there or do this, we cannot hear the whispers of love. We do not presume to come to you expecting easy grace for we are aware of what it costs you to forgive us, tender God. But speak the word, and we will know your mercy. Speak the word, and we will be made whole. Speak the word, Jesus Christ, and we will find that faith to trust you in every moment. Amen. Here is good news. Jesus Christ came into our world to save sinners. He bore our wrongdoing in his body on the cross. So then, whatever sin we have, whatever burden we bear, whatever shame we would hide, know this. There is no condemnation, literally none for those who are in Christ Jesus. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God, amen.
Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The epistle is from Galatians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 12. Paul, an apostle, sent neither by human commission nor from human authorities, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the members of God's family who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, so now I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let that one be accursed. Am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the, a revelation of Jesus Christ, the word of the Lord.
I want to invite the children to come down and join me here at the front. Guys, it's good to see everybody. How's it going? Hello, ladies. Good to see all y'all, everybody. Glad you all are here. Come on, Leah, you can come up to me. Hi, everybody. It's good to see all you all. You know, sometimes it's hard to see all you until you actually come up to the front, and then we get to see how everybody is. Come on. We'll sit right there. There you go. Uh, I want to tell you all a story today. Later on in our service, Miss Kim is going to read the story from uh, the New Testament, but I want to tell you the story for today from the Old Testament, and it's about a guy named Elijah. I don't know if you've heard of Elijah or not, but he was a cool, cool guy. And one time, Elijah was feeling like he was the only person who still believed in God. And everybody else, he thought, was believing in another god by the name of Baal. And so Elijah decided to have a contest. He said, i tell you what let's do. He said to all the people, let's see which god is the real god. My god, the Lord god, or your god, the Baal god. So here's what Elijah did. He said, I want us to each build an altar. It's kind of a big pile of rocks like that. And then I want you to get a bull and kill it and put it on top of your rocks, okay? And I'm going to get a bull and I'll kill it and put it on top of my rocks. And let's see which God will send down fire from heaven to burn up the altar. Because that was kind of the way they did worship back in those days. So the people built them a big altar with a lot of big rocks and everything. They killed a bull and they put it on top. And then Elijah built an altar with rocks and he killed a bull and put it on top. And he said, I tell you what, all of you can go first. See if you can get your God, Baal, to send down fire from heaven to burn up the altar. So all the people yelled out, Baal! Baal, send down fire from heaven to burn up the bull and the offering. And guess what happened? Nothing. The heaven stayed shut. There was nothing coming down. So they yelled again. And Elijah this time said, well, you know, maybe he's gone on a trip. Why don't you yell a little louder? Baal, they yelled again. They were just yelling and carrying on. And guess what happened? Nothing. And so Elijah said, well, Maybe he's reading a book, or maybe he's gone to the bathroom. Uh, it really does. They think they said that's what it says in the Bible. So you better really call nice and loud. So Baal, they called again, and they danced all around, and all day long they tried to call Baal. And guess what happened? No. Nothing. You've got the idea. And finally, they were all worn out. And so Elijah said, I want you all to come over here and get with me. And he said, oh, by the way, I want a couple of you to get some buckets, and I want you to pour water all over my uh, altar and my bull. So they poured water on it. And he said, do it again. They poured some more water on it. Do it again. They poured some more water. So now it ran all the way down, and there was water around the ditch. Can you burn up water very easily? It's not very easy. And then Elijah said, now come and sit here. And he said, I'm going to have a prayer. O oh Lord God of Israel, Isaac and Israel, today let it be known to all these people that you are the true God. Now, Lord, let the fire descend. And the fire came down, whoosh, and it burned up the bull, and it burned up the rocks, and it even burned up all the water. And all the people said, now we know that it's not Baal, but it is the Lord God who is the true God. And that's how Elijah won the contest with the people who thought that Baal was the true God. Okay? Put your hands together. We're going to have a prayer. Thank you, God, for stories from the Bible. Help us to love you and serve each other for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, guys, thank you. Glad you came up, and we'll see you later. Our gospel reading today comes from Luke, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Jesus heals a centurion's servant. 
After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. But only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I am also a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. And all God's people said. So most of you probably know from the promotion that we've done that this coming Friday is Food Truck Friday. It's the first one. We're hoping for three more. It is a brand new event that we hope will be a lot of fun, not only for Harvey Brown, but for our neighborhood as well. It was a surprise to all of us to read about it in the Courier Journal before the event was even coordinated. What was most surprising about the article was the title, Presbyterian Church Sells Beer. As if that's what these events are all about. Your session made a groundbreaking decision for Harvey Brown. How did it happen? Well, I believe the Holy Spirit is hard at work in this place. We've been doing lots of groundbreaking things. I've worked here for 16 years, and for the first time, we canceled the 830 service and Sunday school for three weeks in a row, and it wasn't even summertime. How did that happen? Well, again, the Holy Spirit was hard at work. During those three weeks, many of you came together to listen to each other, to to discern who we are, and explore who we want to be, for the next 100 years. I feel pretty certain that we will not be remembered as the only Protestant church to sell beer. I believe that we will be known for who we are based on our goals, our core values, and the hopes and dreams we have for our church. The only way this process can happen is to open ourselves to where the Holy Spirit flows. We have no control over that. We can only harness her power, and as a congregation, we do that together because we feel that the power lies with the people, the Holy Spirit working through the people to make what they, as a whole, feel are the best decisions for the church. And leadership involves risk and judgment and listening and patience every time we discuss church matters. In our Galatians text today, Paul doesn't have that congregational support. He is on his own, revisiting Galatia, astonished that the Christians there were turning to another gospel, being convinced by others that there really is no gospel at all. He has to remind them that the gospel he shared with them is truly from Jesus, and not based on the opinions of others, because his job isn't about being a people pleaser. Paul is a slave to Christ, only preaching what has been God-given. Paul was on his own, having to return to these places, preaching over and over to make the people feel the power of the Holy Spirit moving within their community, calling them to hear and believe in the truth of the gospel. He could have used a traveling session on his journeys. 
In Luke, Jesus heals the slave of a centurion. A centurion's an officer of the Roman army who commands 100 soldiers. They hold high positions of authority in society. Verse 8 of Luke says, I'm also a man appointed under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and the servant does it. But is that what the story is really about? Is the focus on the centurion's authority or the healing of his slave? No. The story is about what leads up to this miracle. The fact that the official has a slave that he values reveals a lot about him. Roman owners of slaves could treat them as they saw fit. They could punish them whenever they wished, even kill them if they felt like it. Slaves were dispensable. The fact that this man cared enough to want to save him indicates that this man was a good man, a compassionate man. He did not see his servant as replaceable. This would not have been a common view for a Roman official to have. In addition to his relationship with the servant, he's also a friend to the Jews. He's a Gentile who has a great relationship with the Jewish elders. In our story, he sends some of them to ask Jesus to heal his servant. These people need to plead with Jesus, since what they're asking for is a Gentile army official. But Jesus doesn't need any convincing. Without so much as a question, Jesus goes with the elders to visit the centurion's house to see what he can do for the slave. But he has stopped short of the home. This is the centurion's doing. He doesn't feel like he deserves the visit. He has a reverence for Jesus that is definitely out of the ordinary for a Gentile, much less a Roman official. He doesn't want to ask Jesus to do something for him when he can do nothing for Jesus. He feels unworthy, and he obviously has a strong faith in Jesus' power. So much so that he feels Jesus only has to speak a word from afar and that will be enough to heal his servant. So Jesus stands at a distance before the crowd that has followed him, and at a distance from the centurion's home. He marvels at the centurion's faith while indirectly healing his servant. What, on the surface, looks like a story about healing, turns out to be a story about faith, the extraordinary faith of someone who is able to see beyond human authority and trust in the authority of Jesus. How do we trust in the authority of Jesus? A better way to ask that question is, how do we express our faith? Well, we are here in worship. We serve others through mission. We attend Sunday school classes. We help out in the church office or paint all over the building. And wow, we attend lots of meetings. Yet, none of this is about us. None of it. It isn't about how much we do, or how we do it, or who does it best, or who does more, or who does it the same, or who shakes things up and does it in a totally different way. It isn't about any of that. At least we try to make it not about those things. Because if it was, why do it here, at church? Why do it with these same faces, day after day, week after week, year after year? Because our service means something to us. And it means even more when we do it together. Big things happen when we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit and do good works in God's name. The Holy Spirit may not choose the paint colors, although based on the number of people, and there were a number of people who asked me, who chose the colors for the hallways? Maybe we should have let the Holy Spirit make that decision. <laughs> yes, I was on that committee, and I do like the colors. But God doesn't really care what color our walls are, what color our bathrooms are. We serve here because we are called to do so, and we all gain something from it. It's the way we nurture our faith and the way we express our faith in a true Christian community. We seek spiritual fulfillment, fulfillment in many different ways. 
What works for some doesn't work for others. I can tell you that for a fact. There are many committees in this church, and every one of them has a different rhythm. The same spirits at work, but it works in and through our committees in different ways. It works through different means, different ideas, new ideas, and more recently, new leadership. Our new elders who were ordained and installed a month ago, and two of them just last week, just attended their first committee meetings last week, and a new legion of third-year elders took the reins. The members of the various committees don't get to experience that night like I do. I flip-flop between four of these meetings every month. I like having four on one night, though. That's kind of nice. I flip-flop between them, and I witness all of them doing good works in the name of God. But Frank's leadership is different than Doug's, and Doug's leadership is different than Dave and Cynthia's, and Dave and Cynthia's leadership is different than Linda's, and Linda's is different from Pat's. But that's a good thing. When one meeting consists of reviewing bids for abatement and chillers that are about to explode, and another makes decisions about which mission, project, which mission projects we do, the air feels different. When one committee is asking, what is the proper time to hold worship services, and another is asking whether or not to sell beer on our property, the air feels different in those rooms too. All committees at some point have huge decisions to make. That is you at work. That is the Holy Spirit hard at work. When the Spirit moves, we become one with it. There's no more individual ministry where we make individual decisions, sometimes based on our individual wants. When the Spirit is at work in the community, the church becomes an outpost for the kingdom of God, not for high horses. There's no room for high horses in any of our meetings. The power of God at work is enough to fill the room. The power of God is much stronger than the power we think we might have alone. When we step back from our positions at work, in our families, in our churches, and we let the power of God in, amazing things can happen. This centurion, who literally rode on a high horse, had no trouble humbling himself before one who rode on a mere donkey, one who didn't wear armor but who wore a robe, one who didn't live in a palace but didn't have a home, one who didn't have the command over 100 soldiers, but one who, with his faith and humanity, gave us the great command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And a second like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus commanded the trust and respect of everyone, even Gentile army officials whose power paled in comparison to the power of God. Let this official's reverence for Jesus and his humility be examples for us on our journeys of faith. Let us come from our different places and together beckon to Jesus, knowing that it won't take much convincing for a miracle to happen. Amen.
say what we believe using the words found in your bulletins. We belong to God, eternal and infinite, creator of all things and all that is to come. We follow Christ who comes to us from God and reveals God to us. He heals people and transforms lives. He calls us to join in ministry. He was crucified, died, and was raised again by God and reigns over all creation and bids us to die and rise with him in the service of the healing world. We are moved by the Holy Spirit, of saints, as members of the body of Christ, God's holy universal church. We are confident in the forgiveness of sin, the power of the resurrection, and the reality of the eternal life. In all things, it is our desire to rejoice. God's grace, the Holy Spirit, God's glory. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord our God, you know who you are dealing with, human beings with a good conscience or with a bad conscience, some happy, some sad, some secure, others insecure, Con confirm believers and lukewarm Christians. You have assured us that we belong to you and have called us to pray for others. So we come to you and ask that you might remember the church and its leaders, that during these times of fear and famine, of war and worry, you might bring hope, food, and calm to this your troubled world. May you, by your great mercy, lift the oppressed and befriend the lonely. On this Memorial Day weekend, we especially remember all those who have been willing to go to war and put themselves in harm's way fighting for peace. As the wind softly flutters the flags in the cemeteries, marking the graves of the brave, who gave their lives in order that others might live, may those same winds fill us with a sense of gratitude for the gift they have given each of us. Most of all, we pray that you might help us find ways to settle our differences without the violence of war. We also pray for our own members, even as many huddle around hospice beds for a friend or a family member. We pray for those battling life-threatening diseases, such as cancer. Comfort family and friends in those times of crisis as they seek both help and hope. We pray for those battling addictions, struggling to keep above ground even as heroin or alcohol or meth seeks to pull them under. We ask all these prayers in your powerful name, knowing that even though we are no match for the powers of this world, those same powers are no match for you. Hear us now as we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are pleased to have with us today Karen Morris, who's going to speak with us about world mission. Good morning. Dobre rano. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and be a part of your worship services this morning and to visit you here at the church. Uh, my name is Karen Moritz, and I am finishing my service as a mission co-worker with Presbyterian Church USA World Mission. I've been serving for six years in the Czech Republic, 
working with our partner denomination there, and I have a secret to tell you. Are you ready? You're all secret checks. You know why? Because you're going to have a truck with beer. <laughs> I love it. You didn't know it, but you're all secret checks. It really is a joy to be with you to tell you a little bit about World Mission. And uh, Pastor Kimberly asked you in the sermon, how do we express our faith? Well, you express it, as she said in her sermon today, in many ways here in your, your congregation. But one way that hasn't really been mentioned yet is your support of World Mission is a critical way that you help express your faith. I suspect, even though now I probably whetted your appetite thinking that Czech Christians drink beer, because they do, that you might want to go to the Czech Republic now, but just in case you don't feel God calling you to serve in other countries and other parts of the world, God has laid it on the hearts of some of us to do that on your behalf. So we serve on your behalf in countries all around the world. Yes, we have mission personnel in Europe. I know that seems to always get forgotten, but we do have many mission personnel in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, in Latin America, and yes, in North America as well. We are able to serve on your behalf to help share the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only in what we say in our words, but also in our life, in our willingness to be partners with our fellow Christians in other parts of the world. And an important way of doing that as well is that we are agents of reconciliation, uh, not just in our congregations, but in places around the world where there is a tremendous amount of strife or where people are struggling to bear witness to the presence of Jesus Christ in the world. And in some parts of the world, our mission personnel work directly to help alleviate, alleviate poverty. That is uh, sadly very much a part of life for many Christians. So I want to invite you to take the pledge. By the pledge, we mean, first of all, to pray. Please continue to pray for the mission personnel that serve on your behalf all around the world. To learn about the mission service and those who serve on your behalf. One great way to do that is to go to our website at www.pcusa.org. Go down to the bottom of the page and you'll see a, a phrase that says world mission. Click on that baby and you will find all kinds of wonderful stuff that tells you and will help you learn. And maybe you have a passion for a part of the world uh, that's different than the Czech Republic. I, I can't imagine that personally, but maybe you do. So you can go there and look and see where uh, other mission personnel are serving. Or perhaps you'll be traveling this summer if you're lucky enough to do that and you're going to a different part of the world, contact the mission co-worker that works there. They'll be happy to help orient you to that part of the world and perhaps, you know, we'll show you around a little bit and let you know what kinds of things are happening there. So there are many ways through that website that you can learn. Also, I invite you to continue to encourage uh, your mission personnel. I know I would get often little notes uh, sometimes on uh, my email, sometimes actually physically sent to me in Prague, that were a tremendous encouragement to me, particularly when I first moved to the Czech Republic and I was trying to learn Czech and I was in this new country and feeling a bit overwhelmed at times. And the encouragement I would get uh, from congregations, from women's groups, from PW groups, uh, was really, really meant a lot to me. So I encourage you to continue your acts of encouragement and discern the ways that you as individuals and a congregation continue to be called to serve, to express your faith in service through world mission. And of course, invite you to give uh, as your congregation is able, as you as, are able as individuals to give to those who serve on your behalf around the world. And finally, to engage, to recognize that we are all part of the greater church that the church is more than Harvey Brown Presbyterian Church, but that we are part of God's universal church. And one way that we express our faith is by engaging with our brothers and sisters around the world. So I invite you to take that pledge to continue in your loving support and service for World Mission. And on behalf 
of World Mission and all of us who serve you around the world, I want to say thank you. Thank you very much for all that you do, for all your support. And I'll be around a little bit after worship, so if you have any particular questions, I'd be happy to chat with you about that. Once again, thank you. Thank you, Karen. We're thankful for all of God's blessings. We're thankful for the work of mission here and all over the world. Let us receive our offering. Be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Creating God, your perfect grace is with us always. Redeeming God, help us to follow Christ, who loved and served humbly. Sustaining God, empower us with your Holy Spirit as we serve in the name of Christ.
Again, I want to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us for the first time and those of you who are visiting with us. If you have any questions about the church, feel free to ask any of the staff, or I think there are people running around here in aprons that say reach on them. Um, you can talk with them as well. I don't think there's much to say other than know and trust that the Spirit is hard at work in this place. And even when you leave this place, the Spirit is working with you in this community and beyond. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.